Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, the screaming electric ghost of a machine that's been tortured to death, which is a fitting uh, appellation for me today because, my god, I have had some technical issues. Um, so I've spent the entire weekend trying to figure out what the problem is, but as far as I can tell, my recording software no longer work. Both the one I've been using and the backup for that have just stopped working. I don't know why, there's no kind of error code, I don't even know how to search for a problem, and after spending the whole weekend and having something like three hours of help from uh, a friend of mine who's much better at computers, <laughs> I don't know what's up, it's not working, I don't know what to do about it, so here I am using the backup for the backup, i.e. the old software that I, that I used to use that is less stable and has a lower quality output generally, um, so if there's a quality dip for in this episode and ongoing, then unfortunately that's just something we're going to have to live with. Um, I'm going to continue to try and sort things out and figure out what's wrong and make it work. And also, if you know anything about computers, um, DM me, hit me up, message in the comments. I don't just, you know, please help. I'll detail the problem to you somewhere else because this is uh, less of a... Uh, easy solution to Google, like it's there's nothing, it's hard to describe uh, in a way that will get you good results on Google, let's put it that way. So, all that aside, let's continue. So I think I said something last time about how that mechanic was only used in that chapter, it is actually used in this chapter as well. I forgot that these are two separate chapters, I thought they were the same one. So in this section you need to guard these torches while they very slowly light and try and stop the shadow people from putting them out, I guess. Um, I generally prefer to get one lit and then light the other two because once one's lit you can use the fireballs to deal with these guys much more easily and at range. So uh, instead of trying to keep all three going at the same time, it's just easier to do it this way. Or instead of doing one at a time, which is really, really slow. So, um, this section is actually quite useful to talk about, aha, uh -huh, there we go. This section is useful to talk about, um, something about the studio and about the design of the game. So, um, I'm not great at my technical understanding of how games work under the hood. However, a friend of mine is, and shout out to her, the, uh, way that source works essentially means that it's very good at putting large blocky shapes together very quickly and quite bad at putting more complicated organic shapes together. So if you're designing a game uh, in the source engine you generally are having office blocks, you know, half lifey type situations. And um, not the extensive weird organic stuff that you get in this game. And of course this, this is the kind of architecture that the Source Engine does good. Uh, did it turn on? Yeah, it did. Whoop. Don't you dare put that out. They just can't get enough of that candle. Um, so, what the hell was I saying? Yeah, so this kind of architecture is the kind of architecture that the Source Engine is good at putting together. Um, and the kind of architecture you see everywhere else in all of the rest of the game, and the kind of you know, physical spaces, is uh, very much not what the Source Engine is good with. This is interesting because um, Ace Team, the studio, actually have <laughs> outright said that they like to think of themselves as doing what the engine doesn't. They pick an engine for their games that doesn't really support and isn't really built to do whatever it is they're trying to do. So, um, that fits for that particular aspect, but there's an amusing and ironic underside to that, which is that they actually originally started making this game in um, the Diablo 3, not Diablo 3, what the hell am I talking about? Uh, the Doom 3 engine. But they actually switched to Source because the Doom 3 engine can't handle exteriors. So ironically, they uh, tried to do what the engine couldn't and didn't, and then went to a different engine that could do what they wanted to do. So, in face of the sort of, for lack of a better term, primordial aspects of a lot of the, the places we've been to and the characters we've seen, 
this is very much riffing on, you know, ancient architecture as we as we know it in the real world. The architecture of ancient places. Uh, big stone monoliths. And uh, the iconography of such a place is very clear as well. Is this a king? Are these gods? We don't know. And there's something interesting about that, which is that this game implies so much with its iconography. Um, and it tells you directly so little, and I think that that is really almost unique in games, or at least in, you know, 3D running around and punching and shooting games. Because this isn't really a AAA title, but it's in the vein of AAA style design rather than, you know, indie game. Or at least it was the case when this game came out, because there's a lot more um, diverse kinds of indie games now. So, um, almost any game would have its grand narrative, its vanished, you know, it's a fantasy world with a vanished ancient people who were some kind of precursor entity that had strange powers and extra good magic or technology or whatever that is vanished in the modern day. That's a really common fantasy trope and it's common in tons of games. And it's also true here, except that None of that stuff is ac actually explained or stated in this game. It's something you can infer from this, but the actual details are completely missing, and I really, really appreciate that. I respect that um, as a creative decision. I think it works better this way. I think that this being some kind of existential realm at the end of the world is a more interesting idea than this being the remnant of some kind of... Um, lost uh, precursor civilization. So I'm doing a bad job at keeping these things clear, but uh, we should be through this in a second. I say getting absolutely blasted. Keep your balls to yourself. There we go. Right, one left. So when you're playing this and you're not talking at the same time, it's really easy to light all four of these at once and just keep these guys, you know, conveniently re-deaded. Unless they were ever alive to begin with. Anyway, so there's something else I want to talk about which will be relevant shortly, which is that, well, it following on directly from what I was just saying, actually, the kind of narratives used are often epic, um, you know, high-stakes adventure narratives. We've found an ancient city and we accidentally woke something up there and now we have to save the world from it, or whatever other, you know, set of details you want to put in these tropes. But Xenoclash is really tightly focused on one particular story, and it's one very personal story. And it's a story about this family. Are you okay? Yes, I was scared. But I didn't see any more of those shadows. Did you open the doors? I don't know. So very often um, you'll get kind of arch comments about games saying, like, oh, it's not really, it's not uh, a superficial story. It's it's really deep. It's about these themes. It's about this thing and that thing. And, and it's about family or soul or drive or whatever the hell. It's not. It's always a story about saving the world from something. That is what I admire about Xenoclash. It actually really is about what it's about. It is about this one family and the interpersonal dynamics and the tensions and... For example, the guilt behind Father Mother, which we'll get to later. What is this place? Who are you? We're not lost. We were going that way until we bumped into you. No, God. There isn't anything left there. Surprised I know your name. I know everything about you. Deadra. Every step you take 
away from Halstom is to find something better, but every place you leave is worse than the last. We must go back to the real world and solve the problems you are escaping from. Why would you want to come with us? Here I was a prisoner, but you have freed me. But we will never be safe in Halstom. You didn't have me with you before. I can help. Gat, it sure would be nice to go back to a normal place. We already saw the end of the world. So Golem here just gets 10 points for outright stating one of the themes of the game, which is always something I find very amusing. So, um, yeah, one of the themes of the game is that you can't really run away from your problems. Um, and I think it's interesting that uh, Gat's monomania fits exactly into that. He's a Corvid, so he's obsessed with one particular thing. And what is he obsessed with? Running away from this particular problem. But you can't escape it forever. He has to go back eventually. In this sense, Golem almost serves as, as, serves as a direct authorial hand, just dropping straight into the text to kind of chivvy the characters onto their proper path. And um, in that respect, I love that there's kind of the... The <laughs> greater narrative only actually exists to help the more personal narrative of Gat's family. The big mystery of this ancient place, we don't actually need to know about that. We don't need to learn about that. It doesn't matter. What matters is that someone has told Gat, no, you need to go back and sort this out. Eventually, you can't get any further. Now, Golem talks periodically during this ride, which is why I keep pausing, because I think he's about to say things. And uh, it's really difficult to time it because I don't want to be speaking. The uh, there we go. What did you do there? I had a duty to stay there, to watch, to wait. Long before you were born, I was there. And the people who put you there, are they still around? No, they are dead now. Didn't you try to escape? No. The people who put me there were wise. They knew the course of history, and they knew I would be needed in the future. But... <clears throat> I see you don't understand. History. History is the pattern of stories. Every story. All the past. But if they were dead, you didn't need to stay there. I don't obey those people. I obey their ideals. So I want to talk about Oxamata quickly because the story introduces Oxamata to introduce the concept of moving forwards no matter what, which sounds like a positive ideal, but when you run into something through which you cannot move, you are destroyed or you give in and you lose that idea. So, they show us this specifically so that we then can infer that same thing about Gat. Gat is obsessed with move moving forwards until he eventually reaches a point where he can't move forwards any further. If he kept going, he would have died. That's what Golem is implying to us. And he does the right thing. He gives up on his particular obsessive ideal and decides to move forwards by going backwards? The... That's an arch way to put it. Uh, 
Um, these guys have really no thematic meaning whatsoever, although it would be fun to try and come up with one. But, um, uh, yeah, they're just kind of digs to live in the desert and throw rocks at you for no reason. So, um, there's definitely something to say about these guns, but I don't think I have time right now, so I'll come back to that later. Anyway, I do like the way that Golem is almost a hand from the big mysteries that this game has decided not to deal with. This narrative has decided that its big mystery doesn't matter. The big epic story stuff, that's not relevant. What matters is this family and learning about this family and these people and their interactions and their how they grow and change and how they interact with one another, and the tragedy is of that. So the big mystery almost exists only to reach down into the small mystery and refocuses back on it. You gonna... you got anything else to say, huh? Or are we good? Can I keep talking? <laughs> Lola, do you really know everything about us? I want to hear you tell our story. First. Gat left his family to learn from the Corwit, if you may call that learning. Then he returned to Halston. It is by chance and not virtue that Gat discovered a flaw in Father Mother. That's what I want to know. What was the problem with Father Mother? Gat hasn't told you yet. I should let him decide when to tell you. After that, both Gats and Father Mother's reaction was irrational and violent. I consider both to be criminals. Criminals. That is another word you've never heard. After Gat fought Father Mother, he ran away, and you, Deadra, were most kind, too kind, saving him from apathy and searching for safety with him. So, an important thing to note there is that Golem insists that he won't tell Gat's secret, or Father Mother's secret, rather, uh, and that it is up to Gat to reveal it to Deidre. However, minor spoilers, but later on, he will in fact just straight up tell the secret. This is relevant, possibly, for reasons. Specifically, that is going to be relevant because it represents something about him, which is, again, something about the themes of this narrative and so on, which is that, uh, for all that he professes to hold his ideals incredibly close and indeed be bound to them, um, Golem is perfectly willing to set them aside when he deems it necessary or appropriate. So kind of one of the things is that in the end, almost anyone will set their ideals aside if it is convenient to them. And the only real difference is the extent to which something has to make things easier for you before you decide to do that. Anyway, that's going to be all from me for today. I'll catch you again later, and please, if you have any ideas about what might be wrong with my computer, let me know. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to like and subscribe, and check out the links in the description. Thank you so much for watching.